But I don't just want to be like, okay, that's derivatives done. Now we're going to start something new. No, these two things are actually connected. And I kind of want to talk about the connection between them. And it's kind of going to be antiderivatives is a nice segue between that. Okay, so let's get started here. What is an antiderivative? is not unique. Um, so for example, one third x cubed is an anti-derivative of x squared. Because you would notice if I call this big F, then if I take F prime, the power rule would tell me that x squared would be the result. However, you would also know one third x cubed plus seven is an antiderivative of x squared as well. Why? Because if I set that to big F, then if I take its derivative, I would get x squared, but the derivative of seven is zero, so I would again get x squared as the result. So this is not uh, a unique function. So we see if f of x is an antiderivative of f, then so is this guy plus c, where So this is the notion of an antiderivative of a function. It is a function that when you differentiate it, you get that function. Um, and it's called the antiderivative because you can see that if I differentiate this, I get that. So it kind of means if I anti-differentiated this, I would get that, if there's such a thing as an antiderivative. Um, we'll, we'll actually see if there is a reason. And some of you have done calculus before, so you know. I'm trying to keep the suspense here. So, if such a function exists, and it doesn't always have to exist, provided it exists, you're going to realize that it's not always true. Right? For example, if f of x equals e to the x squared, there is no capital F that will fulfill the role of the antiderivative. Um, so it doesn't always exist. 
Um, but whenever it does exist, it's pretty cool, and we call it the antiderivative of the function. And whenever, whenever we find an antiderivative, adding any constant to that antiderivative will also be an antiderivative, um, because when you take the derivative of a constant, you get zero. That leads us to uh, a little bit of a refinement of the definition. Um, so. Suppose f of x has no constant term. And if I take its derivative, I get the original function, little f of x. Then we call this equation, or this expression, the general antiderivative. And in this case, the big F of x is called the primitive. So you, there's a notion of a general antiderivative because we understand that an antiderivative isn't a unique function. So when everyone talks about the general antiderivative, we mean like, okay, any function plus a constant. It's always assumed that there's a constant somewhere. Um, we probably don't know what it is, but this expression will be called the general antiderivative. But if we separate all the constant terms and only look at the non-constant part of that function, that function is called the primitive. And a little bit more vocabulary here. C is called an arbitrary constant. That's, that's like a phrase that I'll, people say all the time, and I'll say, oh, this is just an arbitrary concept. Um, um, more specifically, because you can't have arbitrary constants all over the place. <laughs> More specifically, C is called the arbitrary constant of integration. So that's a parenthetical statement. I won't always say that, but that's what I mean. And you might ask, what is integration? Integration is the process by which we can find an antiderivative. So let me just say that. Because we will have procedures in place here that allow us to compute antiderivatives. Integration is the process of finding an antiderivative. So, just to talk about the language, because language is super important when it comes to mathematics. I believe I told you guys this, that people are often underestimated. Um, so, just know how to talk about this. Um, so, for example, I could say something like, one third x cubed is an anti-derivative of x squared. In fact, it's the primitive. I can also make the statement that we can integrate x squared and the result is one third x cubed plus c. 
And in this case, the 1 third x cubed is called the primitive because that's the guy with the plus c. So I would call the c, this, in this case, the arbitrary constant of integration. So that's kind of how the language fits together. So we can integrate, or we can say we, have, we computed this function via integration, or something like that. It's called integrating. And I'll, I'll explain some of the meaning behind these words. Um, pretty soon. Something else I'll also explain pretty soon is going to be a notation. So one third x cubed is the primitive. And sometimes you might use the um, objective form of integration, and we might say we can call it the integral of x squared. Of x squared. I'm using this terminology all the time. But again, we don't want to have to write out a sentence every time we want to make this statement, um, so we do have a notation for it, and the notation here would look like this. Have this really um, skinny looking s, you would put it in front of the function x squared, you would write dx here, kind of like the dx in your differential, and you would be able to say this is equal to one third x cubed plus c. Okay, so this is you saying the integral of x squared with respect to others is 1 third x cubed plus c. And everyone will know what that means. It means that this guy is the antiderivative of that guy, meaning if I differentiate this guy, I will get that guy. But I can talk about the relationship in the reverse. And I can say the integral of this, or the antiderivative of this, is that function. And that's like me saying this in words. Okay. So I can say that. So this side is saying the integral of x squared with respect to x. And this, of course, would say is, and then this is the function. It's the primitive. And I can use integral aka uh, antiderivative. So that's the that's the main idea. So in one sense there's not a lot I wanted to tell you about. Um, but in another sense, it's a very important thing to know. There are many ways you can describe it, and we can talk about it in many ways, and I want you to not get lost in the language or the notation. Now, you might be wondering, why this notation? Why that? Well, that's for when we get to the next section. I'm going to tell you why we would choose that notation, because there's a very specific reason why we chose that notation. Okay. Uh, couple of things I want to say here. Well, there are three main things I want to talk about. So one, let's do some remarks. I'll do that. I'll do a remark section. Or something like note. Based on the above, one important thing that should now become clear uh, is that every derivative rule that I've given you so far is also 
antiderivative of root. In reverse. So everything that you've been memorizing so far, you should notice that with a few tweaks here and there for some of them, um, you can actually think of it as going quite literally in the opposite way. Um, so for example, we know that if I took the derivative of sine of x, the result is cosine of x. What you now need to be able to appreciate is that you can state this relationship in the opposite way. You could say the antiderivative of cosine is sine plus a constant, just in case there's a plus c, right? So you memorizing this rule, you technically already memorized another rule that's on the flip side of that point, right? So every rule that you know so far, you can actually turn it around and divide by constants to clean it up a little bit, but you'll end up with another another rule that falls into this section. Um, so what I mean by you might have to clean up a little bit, well, if you look at the derivative of cosine, the result is minus sine x. And so now, if you want to talk about the antiderivative of sine of x, you'd have to put a minus sign in there. Let's see? Because you to if you want to just talk about the sign, I'd have to divide by a negative 1 to be able to talk about the sign, and so there's a negative 1 out here. Um, so you might have to tweak things a little bit, move a constant to the other side, or something like that, but that will essentially... Every derivative rule we, now, we know is also an antiderivative in reverse. Um, most notably, one of the most important rules at this point There's something called the power rule. Now we have a power rule for derivatives, but now we're going to talk about the power rule of integration. So this is going to be the guy that reverses what we know as the power rule. Um, so this is trying to figure out what would happen if I take the antiderivative of something that looks like that. Now, all you need to remember is that the antiderivative is just the reverse of the derivative. And so this just means that whatever I did to find the derivative, I want to do the opposite of that to find the antiderivative. So you'll notice when you find a derivative, okay, so you're going to have um, a power that you're going to, first of all, you're going to subtract 1 from the power, right, and bring it down. So this stands to reason that what you would do is you would add 1 to the power here, okay, which is going to be the opposite. And then what you would do is you would multiply by the old power, right? So if, so if you had, if you wanted to differentiate x cubed, two things happened, right? You would multiply by the 3 and then subtract 1 from the 3. So notice here, this is the old power. You multiply it by the old power. And then you subtract 1. you're quite literally going to do exactly the opposite. You're going to add 1 to the power instead of subtract. And then instead of multiplying by the old power, you're now going to divide by the old power. Right? So it's literally I'm trying to figure out the reverse operation. And of course, I have to put a plus c here. So this is a very important rule. It's called the power rule for integration. One thing you should immediately note is that n cannot be minus 1. In fact, let's put that in a box. So this tells me how I will, a process by which I can find the antiderivative of any polynomial. So I can talk about... Example. I can say, oh, the integral of x cubed is going to be, let's write it out for a little bit, add 1 to the power, divide by the new power, 
So I would be able to say this is x to the fourth over 4 plus c. And what you can note here is that if you were to divide, if you were to take the derivative of x to the fourth over 4 plus c, the result would of course be x cubed. You can check that using your regular power rule. We've just reversed the power rule. Okay. So I think of what it would take to do the derivative. I kind of want to do the opposite. That's why it's called the antiderivative. And that will be able, we'll be able to be finding, finding the antiderivative. So, and of course, you can talk about, oh, x to the seventh dx. That's going to be x to the eighth over eight, right, plus c, et cetera. And because derivatives distribute across sums, it stands to reason that this process would also distribute across sums. And that we can factor contents out and all of that. But I actually want to justify those rules with a different way after we look more about um, this idea over here, the antiderivative. Um, but you should know that that's, a, that's actually a thing. Um, We'll justify later. But this process also has an analogous sum rule and constant factor. So, for example, if I were to ask you what is the antiderivative of, say, x cubed plus 2x squared with respect to x, you would be able to actually, you won't always write this down, but you're thinking of it as just doing these things one at a time. You're thinking of it as I can just do this one and then do that one, right? Even though you're, you might not have to write that down. Um, and another, so this is this, applying the sum rule here. And I'm not gonna justify why this is valid at this point, but it kind of makes sense based on what you know about derivatives. That if I wanted to differentiate a sum, I just worry about each piece individually. So naturally, if I wanted to reverse this process, I only have to reverse the process for each piece individually. And so you also realize that this is a constant times that function. I can move that constant outside this process, right? Because when I was differentiating, I could ignore the constant and do my rule over here. So I'm just, to reverse it, I'm just going to ignore the constant and reverse the rule. And so ultimately, you can now start applying the rule. The power rule says you're going to add 1 to the power, divide by the new power. plus 2, that 2, times, add 1 to the power, divide by the new power. And of course, there's a plus c, because there could be a constant. So, one thing I want you to notice, every derivative rule, you can now think of it in its reverse, and it's also an anti-derivative rule. Um, we'll probably list some next time as well. Um, but the power rule is a very important one. But you notice that it does have a very real limitation. What if your power is minus 1? And so let's deal with the minus 1 case. The n equals minus 1 case of the power rule. Let's say you wanted to find the antiderivative of that. How would you actually do that? I'm also teaching a multi two class this semester, and it's like every time I write on this symbol, I kind of just want to write that down here, but that's not. 
it's not a Calvin one thing. I, I have to like every time to be fighting it because I've been writing it so often. Okay. How would you actually do that? Well, one way you can real one thing you can realize is that you can actually think of this as another way, just rewrite it using your laws of exponents and think of it that way. And now you would say, you have to think in reverse. So you're like, okay, think back to derivatives. What is something that I differentiated and the result was one over x? That's what you have to think. What do you think it is? What would you take the derivative of to get one over x? The log of x. The log of x. Ln of x. There's a little caveat here that students often forget. It is actually something I've proven to you guys before. But remember, we, we, we proved that rule using a kind of log differentiation. We proved that rule using a log differentiation, and then we have to worry about, oh, the x had to be positive for us to take the log. But then I showed you guys that, oh, you don't have to think of the x as positive. It just can't be 0 itself. But it could be negative as well. You just consider the absolute value case. And you realize that when you took the derivative of absolute value of x, 1 over x was still the answer once you did the chain rule. And so it turns out you actually need absolute values here. That will cover all the most general case. And students often forget that. You guys should not forget it. And you can, you can actually do this. Remember, we actually did this, right? To differentiate this guy, it's split into two parts. It was just ln of x if x was positive. It's ln of minus x if x is negative. And so for the ln x, where x is positive, it just becomes 1 over x. For the ln of minus x, we use the chain rule, so it becomes minus 1 divided by minus x. The minus is canceled. And we, get, we got 1 over x at the same time as well. So it turns out the most general antiderivative you can come up with for 1 over x is ln of absolute value of x. It will cover the cases where the x is both positive and negative. Okay? And that's often something students forget, but don't forget it. It should be an absolute value here. So, so that's, that's an important rule. You should know that the antiderivative of 1 over x dx is ln x. ln of the absolute <coughs> value of x. So this deals with all the powers, right? We can take x to any constant power other than negative 1 itself. That's going to be the process by which you find the antiderivative. If the power is negative 1, then ln of absolute value of x is going to be the antiderivative. And all the other functions we've done so far, like the trig functions, those are pretty easily reversible. You pretty much just swap the sides, and if there's a negative sign, you move it to the other side. So we know the derivative of sine x was cosine of x. That means the antiderivative of cosine is sine. If we saw that the derivative of tangent x is secant squared of x, that means the antiderivative of secant squared of x will give you tangent x plus c, and so on and so forth. So all those rules, we're going to be reversing them. So that's actually the first remark that I want to make. The second remark. So we can reverse the rules. I'm just going to talk about so the second remark. I think I'm forgetting something I wanted to tell you guys. But uh, let's say you might say, why is this useful? So whoop to do, we can reverse all these derivative rules. That's a, it's a nice party trick, but why is it useful? Um, there are many reasons. <laughs> and, and this is what the rest of the class is going to be about. Well, not even so much. You, you'll continue this conversation in Calculus 2. Here's an example. It can actually help us solve certain problems, this idea of antiderivatives. 
Um, where normally, um, we would probably think of using derivatives, but they just don't really apply. So here's an example. So here's the situation. A bunch of people throw a drum on off a cliff, right? And and let's say you could measure the speed at which this was done. or more notably, the velocity at which this was done. And so now, someone says, find the position function. Okay, so let's say you want to create a function that's going to track uh, Javon's position after time t, after he's thrown off this cliff, okay? And of course, we're going to be physicists here. We're going to ignore air resistance and all that other stuff. That could possibly, you know, what clothing he's wearing. Is he wearing his baggy jeans or his skinny jeans? It, none of that matters, right? Javon is an object falling in a, a vacuum. Okay. So, ordinarily we know, I mentioned this, we know from derivatives. some derivative applications that if you know a function which gives you a position of an object at time t, then if you differentiate that function, you would get the velocity of the object. We also know that if you were to take the second derivative of position or the first derivative of velocity, that gives you another function, which is the acceleration of the object. Okay? So in other words, we have these three things that we know about motion in physics, um, three very important ideas, position, velocity, and acceleration. And we also know to move from one of these to the next one, moving down in this list, differentiation is how we would move down that list. So if someone starts out by giving you the position, you're fine. You can find all these other quantities. But what if you don't know the position? What if you, your knowledge starts somewhere down that list and you need to find something up the list, right? So here we don't actually know um, the position function. We know the initial position at a certain state. Um, but what we actually know is the velocity, right? So we're, we're the really what we, and we don't even know that as a function, that's also the initial velocity. So I have some information down here, but I want to develop fully this function up here. So we know from der derivative theory, differentiation theory, or differential calculus, this is how we can treat this list. But now, we have actually information somewhere in the middle, and we want to actually go back to the top. So now with what we've learned, we know that we can also reverse this list. And integration is how we would reverse the list. So that's one way in which it's useful. There are situations where we know derivatives can handle the situation, yeah, but we don't know that initial piece of information that we need in order for the derivative to be able to do its work. So what we have to do is sometimes we have to go back fill in the blanks, and then we can use differentiation to do what we need to do. And, but the question is, how do you go back? Integration is how you go back, okay? So in that way, it's useful. So derivatives are useful all over the place. We've looked at tons of applications. So pretty much in any of those situations where a derivative would be a good thing to be able to do, 
if you have information in the middle or the end of that process, integration is what allows you to go back and figure out what you might have, might have missed in that process. So it's useful in that way. It, it now gives you the power to jump between the start and end of your problem and fill in gaps as you're going along. Okay, so that's one reason why it is important. So knowing this, we can um, know how to solve a problem like this, whereas someone who only knows about derivatives could not solve this problem. It would be an impossible problem um, if all you know is derivatives. You wouldn't be able to actually find this function. Um, Sometimes you'll also need some um, background knowledge. <laughs> and, and at this point, and in, in your physics class, you'd be expected to know some things. Uh, for one, the acceleration due to gravity. Meaning, if there's no, if there's no force acting on an object, and it's just falling towards the Earth, and the only thing that's moving this object is the gravity of the Earth, how fast is its speed changing? Um, does anyone know? Anyone in physics? Yeah. 9.89 Right. It's 9.81 meters per second squared. Um, do you know what it is in feet per second squared? No. It's 32. So these are kind of quantities that you're expected to know. Okay. So now it turns out that even the velocity function is not fully known. I just know about the velocity at one instant. I don't know about velocity in general. Okay. But as far as the gravity that the Earth will exert, I know that in its totality, it's a constant. Right? It's assumed to be constant. It turns out different places in the Earth will actually experience slightly different gravity. But it's considered a constant, right, right? as a convention. Right? So this is the average gravity across the surface of the Earth, so we just take that to be gravity. Um, so, okay, that we know in its totality, right? That gravity is, with, with respect to the Earth, is that, right? On Earth. Okay, so as far as we know, in this list, the only thing we really know all the information for is acceleration all the way at the bottom of the list. And we're asked to talk about the top of this list. And so what we can do is things antiderivatives. So what we're going to do is we're going to start at the end. We're going to start with the fact that I know the acceleration at any time with respect to gravity. Since we're talking about distance in feet, this is going to be minus 32. And it's minus because it acts downwards. By convention, um, usually in these problems, we consider the negative as the downward direction and the positive as the upward direction. So you can also interpret this uh, velocity, meaning the students threw up, right? So they threw up at 10 feet per second. So he, he falls off the cliff like that. So now, at this point, all we know about is acceleration. So the thing is, we can actually move to talk about velocity, right? Move up the list one rung by doing integration. So we're going to integrate. So now we're going to think, um, what did I have to differentiate to get minus 32? Well. If a derivative gives a constant, it means the original function was just that constant times the variable, plus c. Right? If there was a constant here, it would have gotten lost. Okay, so I want to actually know more about, you guys have this written down. Okay, so here I know the general form of my velocity function. It's a linear function, but there's an arbitrary constant in it. I need to figure out what that is. Now we know, in the beginning, at time zero of this whole episode, um, the velocity is positive 10. Right? 
right? So we have an arbitrary constant, but it, but it turns out that somehow we know information by which we can actually determine this constant. This means if I take minus 32 times 0 plus c, the result will be 10. And then I'll be able to get c equals 10. So that means my velocity function will be minus 32 t plus 10. And that's the velocity of this situation. When time is 0, the velocity is 10. But clearly, as time starts to go on, the velocity is going to slow down. So I'm adding a negative number to that 10. Now what we can do is ultimately we want to talk about the position function. And again, to move one more step. So we're here. We found all the information filled in all the gaps. So we're going to make one more step to go to the top. And so what we're going to do is, again, integrate. So now this is like t to the 1, applying the power rule. I'm going to add 1 to the power, divide by the new power. Applying the power rule here, I get that. I can think of this as 10 times t to the 0 and apply the power rule. And then there's going to be another plus c, perhaps different from the original plus c. I don't personally care, but if you want, you can distinguish between your plus c, so you can call this c2 and c1. I, I don't care. You should just know at any time I put this down, it could be a different number. Okay. It's arbitrary. It's called an arbitrary constant. It could be whatever. Right? So now we have that. Now ultimately, this is what we want. We want the position function, but again, it's not fully known because there's an arbitrary constant. Could we figure out what that constant is? Well, yeah, because we do know the initial position. We actually know that the starting position was 500 feet, because that was the height of the cliff. And so this basically means that if I plug in time equals 0, here I get minus 16 times 0, plus 10 times 0, plus the c would give me 500. This means that the c is 500. And ultimately, what this means is I can now talk about the position function. And ultimately, the position function is going to be that. And with this function, I can now track the position sum with glee. Right, where is Javon at any time after he's thrown off this cliff? That's where we're going to sort of see the connection between antiderivatives and the second half of the class. It's going to be a very curious thing to figure out. So we'll start next class with that and then talk about sigma notation. So we're going to go into the appendix. You guys can start reading into it. Um, it's covered in the appendix. We're going to make sure we have that under control and then move on to integration next week.